Well, again, as I've mentioned, we are returning to our study on the Holy Spirit, and uh, just want to review since it's been a few weeks since we've uh, been in uh, this particular study, uh, why it is that we uh, study these things, why the Lord would have us to know these things. Uh, I think the first reason is, of course, because the Lord wants us to know Him. Uh, he wants us to come into a personal relationship with Him, of course. And we can only do that through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, but it's the Holy Spirit who actually brings that relationship about. He's the one who makes it possible. But we also want to know about Him. We want to know about His work, about who He is and what it is that He does and His particular work in redemption. As we were looking at the Great Awakening, we wanted to be reminded who it is that brings about this awakening, where we're actually brought to, to be afraid of our sins. And we um, look to the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver us, uh, who this one is that actually brings about the new birth, uh, makes us new creatures so that we can trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, the one who also does this on a more global scale, or at least more widespread, the one who brings about revival, the one whose ultimate job is to move the kingdom of heaven uh, ahead to advance it uh, through God's people. So anyway, we want... Um, we want to understand more of the uh, work of the Spirit of God, not only that we might understand what's going on in our own hearts, but also so we might better know how to pray. As um, we look to the Father in the name of the Son for the work of the Holy Spirit to do everything that the Lord essentially calls us to do as Christians. And uh, this evening, we really want to focus on why it is that the Spirit of God is the one who does this. But before we do that, let me just quickly review what we've seen so far. We have seen that the Spirit of God is not an impersonal force, but He is, in fact, a person. Uh, we saw just quickly by way of review that He is one who thinks, He is one who loves, He has purpose, He teaches, He guides, He convicts, He can be resisted, He can be grieved, He can be quenched, lied to, blasphemed. Uh, he also commands, he comforts, and he prays. And this is just a short list of all the things we know the Spirit of God does. So we know that he is a person, because really all these things can only be true of a person. Uh, we saw, secondly, that he is a divine person, that Scripture calls him God, that, uh, as I already mentioned, he can be blasphemed. And remember that he is the only person of the Godhead who is singled out as um, when he is blasphemed, that that particular sin is unpardonable. I don't think we could conceive of a, um, <clears throat> a, a punishment that would be greater for, for someone who is less than God, uh, less than it would, would, it would be for one who is God. Well, the Holy Spirit, if you blaspheme him, that sin never has forgiveness. We've seen that he is equal with the Father and with the Son, that he has authority over the church, he is said to have infinite knowledge, infinite presence. Um, if He is in you, you uh, basically you are called the temple of God. Uh, Jesus is called the Son of God because He was begotten by the Holy Spirit. Uh, he is eternal, He is omnipresent, and we've seen that He also creates. So all of these things tell us that He is, in fact, God. So seeing that He's a person, seeing that He is God, we looked last time at the fact that He is a distinct person from the other persons of the Godhead. In other words, He is not a mode of a unipersonal God as though God is one person and reveals Himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, that, as we saw, is what Monarchianism teaches, the idea that when Jesus suffered on the cross, it was the Father who was suffering in Him, the divine person was suffering in this uh, humanity, uh, a view called patropassionism, which has been rejected by the church. Uh, we, we reject that idea. We believe the Bible teaches the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are separate persons. Uh, for instance, the, uh, the Father is said to love the Son, and the Son is said to love the Father, which means they must be distinct persons. Uh, Jesus is said to send the Spirit. And the Father is said to send the Spirit, which means that the Father and the Son are distinct from the Spirit. You can't basically send yourself, as it were. 
And then, of course, when Jesus was baptized, we saw all three persons being represented at his uh, baptism. Uh, Jesus came up out of the water. The Spirit of God was descending from the heavens and a voice from the heavens saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So he is a person, he is a divine person, and he is distinct from the Father and the Son. Now this evening what we want to do is delve a little bit more deeply into the distinctions that exist between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we want to understand what it is that God has revealed about himself in this regard, so why they, these three persons are actually called by the names that they are called by, at least the names that they have revealed themselves by. Uh, we do need to remember that uh, the Word of God is God's revelation to us. Uh, we didn't choose to call the Father, the Father, the Son, the Son, the Spirit, the Spirit. Uh, these are names that they used to reveal themselves to us. So uh, the question is, what does God mean by these names? And since the term Father applies only to one, the Son applies only to one, and the Spirit applies only to one, what is it that actually separates them? How are they, how are they different? I think we've, uh, we've already seen that uh, they are the same in, in many ways. I mean, how many gods are there? Okay, there's one God. And what is true about this one God? What's that? Okay, he's three persons. But what is true about uh, the being of God? What are some of his attributes that he has? Omnipotent? Omnipresent? Okay, omniscient, right? He's simple, he's independent, he's unchangeable, and all these different things are true. Now, all these things that are true about God are true of each of the persons of the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And yet, there appears to be at least something that is different about them. Besides the fact that they are three separate persons, there is something that is distinctive to each one of them that is expressed in these names, and that's what we want to look at this evening. Now, why, this, this is a difficult subject, by the way, so I'm not going to be able to ask a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll do the best that I can. But let's, let's start here. What is it that is true of a father as distinct from a son? Position, Position certainly, uh, could, would, would certainly be a part of it. Which, what, where would the priority lie between father and son? Okay, with the father. What other thing would be true of a father as distinct from a son? Besides authority, besides position, besides, pri well, priority. Age, certainly age. And um, uh, I mean, what, what do you typically think of when you think of a father and a son? I mean, who, um, what's that? Parentage. Parentage, okay. And in, in, in parentage, one begets the other, right? Okay, so one begets and the other is begotten. Historically, that's how this is viewed, right? The idea that the father is the one who begets, and as you might suspect, the son is the one who is begotten. All right, we're gonna come back to what that might mean, but let's ask this question first of all. With regard to um, oh, the begottenness of the Son of God, um, does that apply only to his human nature? Is, is, his human, is, is Jesus begotten with regard to his human nature? In other words, was he conceived, was he born? Yes, he was begotten. Does it apply to his divine nature? Okay, yes, it does. By the way, that's one of the reasons why the Father has always been called the Father and the Son has always been called the Son. This, by, I, I should mention... Now, this particular doctrine is actually um, one that's come under question recently, and there are those who debate it. They believe that uh, the Father is called the Father pretty much because uh, he begets the Son in time, in his human nature, and that the second person of the Godhead is eternal, but his relationship was not one of a son to a father. Okay, as a matter of fact, I believe John MacArthur held that position for, for a little while. I think he may have changed his mind on that. 
But there are those who uh, question that relationship, whether it is an eternal relationship or whether it's one that actually takes place in time. Now, as I understand it, those who are Christians, of course, again, don't deny that the first and second persons of the Trinity have always existed, but they're questioning that relationship between them. So I thought we might just pause here for a minute and, and just uh, think about this. What, what do you think? Can you think of anything in Scripture that would demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God, not just in terms of His being born into the world, but that He has always been the Son of God. Anything occur to you offhand? Uh, anyone come prepared to offer some evidence for that? Okay, Hebrews 1. Talking about, uh, okay, let's... <laughs> That's okay. It does say, God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. I think we could argue that point from this text, although some might argue that he's called the Son because he sent the Son into the world, and the Son is the one who. Um, uh, he, to, well, through whom the Father speaks after He comes into the world. And certainly there's no question that He is the one who is the exact representation of His nature and upholds all things by the word of His power. Um, you know what? Um, actually, in Hebrews 1, we go on a little bit further, don't we? To verse 5. For to which of the angels did He ever say, You are My Son, today I have begotten you? And again, I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. Now, again, it, it, someone could argue, I suppose, in a case like this, that, um, uh, that this is talking about something that's going to happen in the future and wasn't happening right then. I mean, this is somewhat uh, prophetic. But again, there are other verses that talk about this idea that the one that God sent into the world was, in fact, the son that he sent into the world. Uh, maybe we could uh, look up a couple of verses, and I, I do think we can argue from this passage. I think this would go either way, but I think these other passages also lean way to the fact this is talking about that Jesus is the Son prior to His incarnation. Uh, can I get a couple of volunteers to read some verses? Okay, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Another volunteer? Sarah, would you look up 1 John 4, verse 14? Uh, one that's very familiar to us that we should all be able to quote is John 3.16. Let's not um, look that one up in particular, but how about John 1.14? Ty, John 1.14. And then I'll take John 1, verse 18. Okay, so let's have the first text, Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5. Oh, you don't have that one turned up yet? I had trouble writing all the verses down. And ah. Okay, do you see anything there that might lend weight to the fact that um, Jesus is eternally the Son of God? This seems to be what it's indicating. That this one he sends into the world is his Son. 1 John 4, 14. Okay, and in essence... Same point, the one he sends is his son. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So the idea of giving is that he gave him by sending him also into the world. Uh, John 1.14. Okay, so do you see anything there that would indicate eternal sonship? Okay, 
Okay. And um, what, what is his relationship to the Father from this particular passage? Okay, there's another word in there that's key. Uh, begotten. begotten, okay. I mean, we're, we're talking about the, if we're talking about the eternal sonship of Christ, we're talking about his eternal begottenness. He's eternally begotten of the Father. At least that's what we believe the Lord is conveying through these names, Father and Son, okay. He is the Father and Jesus is the Son of God. <laughs> Certainly he is begotten in time, but is there, a, is there a begottenness outside of that human begetting? Is there this eternal begottenness? Now, well, I'll tell you what, let's all turn up um, John 1, 18. It'll be interesting to see what our, um, our various texts say on this passage. As a matter of fact, if you don't have the NASB, this, this reading may be quite interesting. Let's, let's get the uh, King James first. Do we, you have the King James here today? John 1.18. Right. Yes. <laughs> Okay, he hath declared or he hath explained him. Now, uh, who has um, anything different than that? Okay, Pam, what do you have? No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, who has explained him. Okay, the only begotten God. Does anybody have anything different than that? <laughs> now, what we have here is a textual variation in the manuscripts, right? And uh, the King James Version, the authorized version, is uh, it, it came about at a time when um, certain texts had not yet been found, I believe, and it was based on what's called the Byzantine text type, which is typically a later text. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but if changes were going to creep in over the years, which they have, I mean, there's, there's no one that actually questions that because we have, let's say, 15th century texts, and then we have some that are actually very, very early, some that are actually from the first century, uh, fragments and second century texts and so forth, and we compare them and we see that there's a difference. Now, those who prefer the King James and prefer the majority text type would say, well, the Lord probably preserved the correct reading in the majority of texts, and so we'll just take what the majority reading is, and, and you know, there's certain reasonableness to that. Others would say, well, those that are closer to the actual event would be those that are actually closer to the truth, and so they would take earlier texts. And of course, those who want the later texts and the majority texts also have arguments to try to show that the earlier texts weren't accurate. But let's just say in this case, uh, what is the case is that the earlier texts actually had the word God here rather than the word Son. One other thing that usually comes in when you're trying to decide what the original reading might have been is when you're looking at the two different options, which would be the harder reading, which would be the one that would be more difficult to understand because that's probably the one that's going to be changed if a change is going to take place. Now, that may not necessarily be true, but they think in this case it is. Who can understand a begotten God? It, it almost sounds like this one is being created somehow, and that he's not eternal. It's talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Does this mean that he has not always existed? Now, actually, what this um, is referring to, or what those who are Orthodox Trinitarians believe, it's talking about the eternal begottenness of the Son, that he is eternally the Son because he is eternally begotten. And that's the only way you can have a begotten God. Does that Makes sense so far? We'll have to explain what that means, that he's eternally begotten. But do you understand what this is saying? 
Okay. So the idea here would be, though, that the Son is called the Son because He's begotten. Uh, he is the Son before He comes into the world. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, when we study next time, and actually we may overlap with, with this one if I don't hurry up, but when we study next time why it is that each person of the Trinity did the particular work that they did in the work of salvation, the fact that the, that the second person is eternally begotten uh, lends itself to the, to the reason why he is the one who is begotten in time in a human nature. Because he is eternally the son, he becomes the son incarnate in the world. Okay. Does everybody um, at least understand that much? Okay. All right, then. The, the next question is, if, if the Father is called the Father because He begets, the Son is called the Son because He's begotten, why is the Spirit called the Spirit? Does anybody know what the word Spirit means in, in the Greek? Any ideas? Breath is, is one translation. Wind, that's right. Any other senses in which Spirit is used? Certainly used of the Spirit of God. Life, okay, the inner life, that which animates a person, is also called spirit. When our spirit departs from the body, the body returns to the dust, so forth. So the word does mean breath, wind, inner life, spirit. It has a variety of meanings. And of course, you have to narrow down the exact meaning from the context of the, uh, uh, you know, that the word is used in, just as you would have to do with certain English words. Like the word green, for instance, what does the word green mean? It can mean color. Ecologically friendly, that's right. Can refer to green, that's money, right? Lay, lay some green, what's that? New or naive, that's right. What was that? Yeah, it can mean green with envy. So, if you use the word green by itself, you, you, don't, you really can't know exactly what it means. You have to see it in its context. And it can mean a whole variety of things, okay? Well, the same thing is true of the word spirit, and it's certainly true of a lot of other words in the Greek as well. But here, when we, what we're gonna be looking at is what's called the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit, or the fact that the Spirit of God is breathed out eternally from the Father and the Son. It's interesting, there is a text of Scripture where we actually see that taking place. Now, again, remember that the word itself, spirit, can mean breathed or breathed out or breath. In this case, the spirit is the breath of God. John 20, verses 21 and 22, so Jesus said to them again, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. So here we have the idea of the Spirit of God being breathed out by the Son of God. Now, we're going to, again, look at, at a little more about what this means. Okay, so Father, one who begets. Son, one who is begotten. Spirit, that which is breathed out the breath of God. The, that's, in essence, what is meant by the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit. Now, I thought it might be useful to look at how this has been explained historically in the church. If you want to grab a hymnal, I believe we have the Nicene Creed in our hymnals. You'll find it after the Psalter readings, I believe, or the readings of the Psalms. Uh, if you look on page 845, actually 846, the back of your hymnal, this belief in this relationship between the three persons and what it is that actually distinguishes them is something that was important enough to the early church to encapsulate in these early creeds. This is something they believed was necessary to confess if you actually believed in the Trinity. The Nicene Creed, now it doesn't go back as far as the Apostles' Creed. I believe the Nicene Creed is the first place we see it. And what was it that was being debated at the Council of Nicaea that was important? What's that? 
Well, okay, it was part of the Trinity. What, what, what part were they actually wrestling about at that one? Do you, does anybody remember what uh, Arius, Arianism is? I think we uh, actually we looked at that last time. Was that? Okay, whether Jesus is in fact of the same substance as the Father. The terms were used, is he homo usios, which means the same substance, or is he homoi usios, of a similar substance? Arius believed that he was of similar substance, that he was a created being similar to God, but not the eternal God, whereas the Orthodox belief is that he is of the same substance as the Father. As a matter of fact, you'll see this in the Nicene Creed. Let, let's just read a little bit of it here. It begins by saying, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds. Do you, do you think they believed in the eternal sonship of, of the Son of God? Yes, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God. Now, they are giving priority to the Father, but they're recognizing that the Son is God of God, light of light, begotten of His Father before all worlds. Okay, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. Now, if you're of one substance with the Father, that means that you are the same being as God is. So that's a statement that has to do with the Trinity. Okay, that, that substance is divine substance. It's the divine, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable spirit that has all the attributes that we've already talked about. Okay, now if we go down a little bit further, we, well, we do see, you know, well, let me just go ahead and finish reading this. By whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man. Now we're talking about begottenness in time was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and descended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead whose kingdom shall have no end. Now getting to the Holy Spirit, and we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. By the way, Catholic there means universal. There's one universal church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. Uh, not sure if we, uh, well, they may have meant something a little bit different about that back in those days, but we understand that differently, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So anyway, the point is, Statements are being made here regarding the eternal Sonship of Christ, regarding uh, the eternal begottenness of the Son, also with regard to the procession of the Holy Spirit. Uh, just, just as a note of interest, the, um, if you look at the second line when they begin to speak about the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, uh, there was this early debate between the, the Western Church and the Eastern Church about whether or not that that uh, those additional words and the Son should actually be included, whether the Spirit proceeds only from the Father or from the Father and the Son. By the way, uh, and the Son in Latin is filioqua, and that's what the debate was called. It was, it's called the filioqua clause, and they debated whether or not that should actually be included. Uh, we believe uh, that it actually should be included. Let me give you... Um, Another couple quotes here from the Athanasian Creed. By the way, does anybody remember who Athanasius was? We're, we're talking about the, um, the ontological trinity or the relationship of the three persons to one another. Why the Father's called, why he calls himself the Father, why the Son's called the Son, why the Spirit's called the Spirit. So far we've seen the Father is uh, the one who begets, the Son is the one who is begotten, and the Spirit is the one who is breathed out by the Father and the Son, okay? And so we're trying to understand what that means, but right now we're, uh, we're looking at the fact that uh, this is something that's been held by the church for a long time. By the way, does anybody know when the Nicene Creed was formulated? 
Oh, it says right here. I'm sorry. Okay. At the Nicene uh, Council of Nicaea, 325. It says it was a, in a, an expanded form was adopted by the Council of Chalcedon in 451. I was going to give you a quote from the Athanasian Creed. I was asking if you know who Athanasius is. Okay. Do you, do you know what error he was addressing? Um, it, had to do with the it was. Same, same thing the Nicene Creed is addressing. So Arius is the one who basically took up the battle. Once the Nicene Creed was, was actually formulated, didn't put an end to the debate, it kept on going. I think you, you may have heard me make reference to uh, Athanasius once before. He was deposed five times from his position as, as bishop in his defense of the Trinity. And on his tombstone, it, it says Athanasius against the world. Sometimes it seems as though Athanasius was the only one who was fighting for orthodoxy only because you had um, various emperors that were kind of coming in and out, some in favor of the Trinity, some not in favor. And when those came in who were in favor of it, he was brought back in. And when those came in who were against it, he went back out. And, there was a lot of politics, <clears throat> excuse me, that were going on. But anyway, his name has been attached to a creed that's called the Athanasian Creed. And apparently, there's a great deal of evidence that indicates he never actually wrote this. But it does reflect what he believes. But this, these, these phrases occur in it. The Father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The Son is of the Father alone not made nor created, but begotten. The Holy Spirit is of the Father and of the Son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. <laughs> okay, so you'll notice the emphasis, though, on um, the idea of, of begetting, begotten, and proceeding, and how these are distinctive of each of these persons. Yes? Well... If, if someone has an offspring in their image, in other words, if, if, a, if parents have a child, that child is said to be begotten. In other words, it's been given birth to by the parents. Okay, so it's, it's procreation, basically. So one gives rise to the other. One has a son, has a child, one that is like them. Okay. Um, if a cat begets a cat, that means the cat has kittens or, you know, some other thing. Okay. Now, again, we need to understand what that means and what it doesn't mean. This is how God has, has revealed himself to us, but we're going to look at, uh, if we do have time, um, that we don't take these terms to mean exactly the same thing that they would for us, that they mean for God. Okay, one last quote from the Westminster Confession of Faith. It's right there after the Nicene Creed in the back of your um, uh, hymnals. If you look at chapter 2 in the third paragraph, and that's on page 850 at the top. Okay. It says, In the unity of the Godhead there be three persons, of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Do you see a sort of a trend here? Okay. Uh, just to show you from 325 and the Athanasian Creed is believed to originate, I think, somewhere in the 6th century, which would be the 500s. And then the Westminster Confession of Faith, which is 1643. Um, this doctrine is of long standing within the church, and it's been held for quite some time. doesn't make it right, right? We have to, of course, see it from Scripture. Um, and I think we ha have actually already seen it to some degree. But um, just to know, that this, this is the mindset of the church. This is what the orthodox formulation of the Trinity is. 
there's different ways to understand the Trinity. We, we understand the Trinity with regard to how the persons relate to one another. That's what we're studying right now. But we also understand the Trinity with regard to their work in salvation. And that's what we're going to be looking at later. But what we want to look at now is how they relate to one another so that we can understand a little bit more about why it is they do what they do in the work of salvation. All right. So to summarize what we've seen so far, the Father is called the Father because He begets the Son. He has a Son in His image. The Son is called the Son because He is begotten of the Father. And the Spirit is called the Spirit because He proceeds from the Father and the Son. The word Spirit means breath, means breathe out. One who is breathed out means wind, it means life. Uh, but in this case, this which is breathed out by the Father and the Son actually is personal and is of the same substance as God. Okay? All right. Now, one thing we need to guard against when we're considering the doctrine of the Trinity is the idea of when these things take place. When does the begetting of the Son take place? When does the procession of the Holy Spirit take place? Do you think that the, the authors of these creeds are actually telling us that there was a time when the Son didn't exist and then the Father begat the Son? And then there was a time when the Spirit didn't exist, but the Father and the Son somehow breathed the Spirit out? Jeremy, wake up. Okay, what was the, what was the answer to the question? Okay, no, why would you say no? Okay, if they're God, they're eternal, and they certainly have, I think to this point, demonstrated that they do believe them to be God. But look at what we've just seen here in uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 2, section 3. It says in the second part, the Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten, okay? Of the Father, the Holy Ghost eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son, which means that this is something that has always been the case. Now, here's, a, here's another question we need to ask did the Father in eternity, because eternity really is timelessness, right? Did he suddenly decide that he's, again, did he make a choice to bear a son? Did, did the Father and the Son make a choice to breathe out the Spirit? You know, again, it's just kind of hard because when we're talking about eternity, we're talking about a timeless situation where decisions really can't be made. But... It's something that is eternal. But what we wanted to see from this, and this is a question that has been asked, is that this isn't a decision the Father makes. This isn't a decision the Son makes. This is just the nature of God, that this is how He is or how they are. They sustain this relationship. It's an eternal relationship. It's an automatic relationship, we might say. It's something that happens because this is God's nature that it happens. It is the nature of the Father that He begets the Son. It's the nature of the Father and the Son that they breathe out the Spirit or that the Spirit proceeds from them. Okay. Now, I realize that still sounds really vague, okay, and, and up to this point, <laughs> it is, all right? And I don't know of too many people who have gone very far beyond this. This is usually where they just stop and they say, we don't understand it. This is just the way it is, okay? And maybe that's what we have to do. But uh, there was at least one person who tried to go a little bit further beyond this, and uh, <laughs> that sanctified genius that God gave to his church so many years ago. Um, he certainly did not like to let things lie. If there was the possibility of trying to explain uh, what, what actually took place here, and, and I'm not saying that his view is necessarily right, nor has it necessarily been adopted by the church. But it is interesting, and we're not going to have time to go too deep into it, especially because of time, but, um, and if we had a chance to look at his whole essay on the Trinity, you might actually be convinced that this is true. But one thing we need to realize, and, and we'll just take a couple minutes to survey his view, and that is that Edwards did not believe that, that these terms, and I don't think anybody 
well, anybody who, who authored any of these creeds we've looked at believed that when the father relates his relationship to the son that it's exactly the same kind of relationship that a father, a human father, has with his son as far as how this comes about, obviously, because it's quite a bit different for us than it would be for God. And obviously, we can't breathe out anything but stale air, you know, so um, it, it's not going to be the same. And yet, the Lord used these terms for a reason, to express a relationship that exists between them. And so how can we understand these things? Well, let me just give you a couple things from uh, Edwards. And, and again, this, this sounds a little bit out there. It sounds a bit abstract and esoteric, I guess you would say. But if, if we had a chance to look at all that he had to say here, we might, we might be able to at least get a glimpse of what he was looking at. Now, what he believes is this, that the eternal begetting of the Son actually comes about by the Father's eternal contemplation of His own image or His own being. In other words, God eternally is thinking about Himself and His image. And basically, the, Jesus or the Son of God is called the image of God over and over again in Scripture. And the idea that the Father in contemplating Himself that somehow that action which goes on eternally is what gives rise to the Son. Now, I know, again, that sounds strange. Let me just read a couple of things of what he says here. This is a quote from Edwards. That image of God, which God infinitely loves and has his chief delight in, is the perfect idea of God. It has always been said that God's infinite delight consists in reflecting on himself and viewing his own perfections, or, which is the same thing, in his own perfect idea of himself, so that it is acknowledged that God's infinite love is to, and his infinite delight is in, the perfect image of himself. But the scriptures tell us that the Son of God is that image. Now, it's interesting, he brings up several places in Scripture where Jesus is, in fact, called the image of God. Let me just read what he says in his essay on the Trinity. Nothing can more agree with the account the Scripture gives us of the Son of God, His being in the form of God, and His express and perfect image and representation. I probably didn't read that very well. Nothing can more agree with the account the Scripture gives us of the Son of God, His being in the form of God, and his express and perfect image and representation, that is, of God. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Philippians 2.6, who being in the form of God, didn't think it robbery to be considered equal with God, but emptied himself. Colossians 1.15, who is Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. Now, again, the idea is, and, and Edwards had a, a unique way of uh, expressing this, that God's comprehensive idea of himself is, is basically, well, Almost, almost like a, uh, well, I, I really, I can't express it very well. We'd actually have to read it. If you want to, we can come back and look at it, but it's, it is kind of hard to grasp. But again, basically he believes that the Father eternally contemplating himself, um, be, and again, I hope you understand what he means here, is that does God delight in, his, in himself? I mean, can God think about anything that is more perfect than himself? If we did that... Okay, we would call that being narcissistic. You know, wasn't it Narcissus who, who basically got enthralled by an image of himself in, in a pool of water, I mean, myth, mythologically. And I think the gods cursed him to become a flower that's next to the water and, and eternally viewing his own reflection because he was so into himself. Well, we're a very narcissistic society. And for us to, to look at ourselves in a mirror and, and just admire ourselves and, and think we're the greatest, you know, that would be pure vanity on our part because there is something better, much better than we are to contemplate, and that's God. But who is there greater than God that he can contemplate? 
eternally. What is it that he can love more than himself? Well, Edwards believes that his eternal contemplation and love for this image of himself is, is what gives rise to this. And again, how one follows from the other, we just, we'd have to look a little more deeply. But let's move to the spirit because this is the most important part. The spirit is, in his estimation, the love that the father has for his image, which is the son, and the love which the Son has for the Father that is breathed out, as it were, or expressed, or that proceeds from the Father to the Son and from the Son to the Father. Okay, That this is the procession. It's their love for one another. Let me just read what it says here. The Holy Spirit is the act of God between the Father and the Son, infinitely loving and delighting and in each other. Sure I am that if the Father and the Son do infinitely delight in each other, there must be an infinitely pure and perfect act between them, an infinitely sweet energy we call delight. This is certainly distinct from the other two. It is distinct from each of the other two, and yet it is God. It is in the Spirit that God is eternal and pure act. So anyway, it's the idea that he has here is that the eternal contemplation of the Father of his own image gives rise to the Son, and the love that they have for one another gives rise to the Spirit. I realize it sounds strange, but this is how he summarizes it. It may be thus expressed that the Son is the deity generated by God's understanding or having an idea of himself. The Holy Ghost is the divine essence flowing out or breathed forth in infinite love and delight, or which is the same, the Son is God's idea of himself, and the Spirit is God's love to and delight in himself. <laughs> Again, it sounds, it sounds strange, but um, it, it, is, uh, it is quite interesting. Let, let, let's just look at one passage of Scripture that seems to reflect this idea, and that's in John chapter 17. By the way, I should mention that Jonathan Edwards has some interesting ideas about why it is that the Spirit of God so often does not seem to appear when the Father and the Son are being spoken of, such as the apostolic benediction, grace to you and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Where's the Holy Spirit? I mean, you do see the Spirit, you know, His name occurring in certain places, such as uh, the the benediction at the end of 2 Corinthians in uh, chapter 13, is, I forget the exact verse, verse uh, at the end of the chapter, the, uh, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of you. The baptismal formula, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But in these apostolic greetings, you, you don't see the, Spirit, the Spirit's name occurring, and yet He's equally divine and to be glorified with the Father and the Son, why isn't he there? And in John chapter 17, when Jesus is praying the high priestly prayer, why doesn't he show up here? Let's look at verses 24 through 26 of John 17. He says, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am in order that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known that the love wherewith you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, I know that John can sometimes be difficult to understand. I don't know if you've had that problem, but just trying to figure out the simplicity of this language. But I want you to notice a couple of things here. He says, um, first of all, let's see. Um, let's see, I, miss, I lost my place. Hold on a second. Oh, well. Okay, he does mention here that there was, um, oh, here it is. In it, the last part of verse 24, first of all, the statement Jesus makes, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. Okay, I don't think there's any question 
that the Father and the Son loved each other in eternity. Okay, I don't think anybody would debate that. I want you to notice the absence, though, of a particular person. Why isn't the Holy Spirit mentioned here? Okay, one thing. Then he goes on, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you yet, uh, I have known you, and these uh, have known that you sent me. And then in verse 26, and I have made your name known to them, and I will make it known, that the love wherewith you loved me may be in them, and I in them. Now, this love that the Father has loved the Son with from all eternity, He wants that love to be in them. That, that's kind of an interesting concept to begin with. He's not saying, love them, Father, with the love with which you've loved me, but He says that love with which you've loved me, let that love be in them. Now, how can that love that the Father has for the Son be in us? And let me ask you this question, is there, I mean, how, how is that love in us? By, by the Spirit of God, right? Okay, and he says, I've made my name known to them and will make it known that the love wherewith you loved me may be in them. In other words, he's revealing to them the Father and basically his plan of salvation in order that that love might be put in them. And yet it's the Spirit clearly in Scripture that is put in us that actually produces what? What does the Spirit of God produce in our lives? Love. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Love. Okay, so Jesus is praying that the Spirit would be put in us. By the way, he also says not only that that love with which the Father loved him would be in them, but he also says that I would be in them. How does Jesus dwell in us? by the Spirit of God. Now, is the Spirit mentioned in this passage? See, there's the question, right? Is Jesus talking about the Spirit? Is He the love with which the Father loved the Son? And is that the love Jesus is praying that He would put in them? And is that the way in which He dwells in us? And could that explain why the Spirit of God isn't appearing here and why He often doesn't appear is because He is, in fact, when, when uh, the apostolic benediction is, or uh, greeting is being given, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Is the Spirit of God mentioned there? He, he is the grace of God, and the grace of God ultimately is that love that He gives to us. I don't know that he's saying unmerited favor there necessarily. He may be saying the Spirit of God dwell in you because he is the grace of God. He's actually that which God gives to us, which we don't deserve, changes our natures and makes us to love the Lord. But I want you to, again, just note what, what Jesus is saying here. He is, if, if this love that he puts in us is in fact the Spirit of God, this is the love with which the Father has loved the Son from all eternity, which goes along quite nicely with what Edwards is saying the Spirit of God is and what that eternal procession of the Spirit is. Now, apart from this explanation, all we know is that the Father eternally begets, the Son is eternally begotten, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Um, by the way, I didn't mention the reason why the idea of this breathing and procession comes up at all is because there's two texts of Scripture, and I think somehow I meant to, to talk about them. Yes. What I meant, when I said earlier, when we were talking about the fact that the three persons are distinct persons, and we don't believe in, in this idea of modalistic monarchianism, uh, Jesus sends the Spirit, and yet the Father is also said to send the Spirit. In other words, both the Father and the Son send the Spirit. The Spirit proceeds from both of them. That's where we get this doctrine of the eternal procession of the Spirit. But how would we get that from that? Well, it's not just from that, but it's also from the, the word Spirit. The word means breathed out or breath, breath of God. The Spirit, what Jesus breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit proceeds from the Son in a certain sense, at least in the economic trinity and the working out of salvation. They believe also that he proceeds in essence eternally and that this is reflected in the work of salvation in the economic trinity, okay? So the Father sending the Spirit, the Son sending the Spirit, the fact he's called the Spirit, he's the breath of God, the fact that 
both the Father and the Son are God. But also this idea here, at least Edwards takes a hold of this and said, the Father is loving the Son and that that is this, this act of infinite delight in the Son. This is almost like the breathing out of his, of his essence toward the Son is the Spirit of God. And Jesus says that this love with which you have loved me, let it be in them. And as a matter of fact, that's exactly why Jesus came into the world, was to bring the Spirit of God back into our hearts because we lost him in the garden. And he brings him back into our hearts because that's the only way that we can love God, that's the only way that we can trust Jesus Christ for our salvation, is that we have the Spirit of God working his nature within us. Uh, basically, there's other passages in Scripture that talk about uh, the idea of this love that um, I think it's in actually the Gospel of John, another place. I don't have the text with me right now, but the idea of the, the Father loving us the way that, um, that He loves the Son, and, and perhaps you know it flows from this as well. But this idea of this love that we would have this relationship with the Father and with the Son, that we would have this kind of love that they have for one another, but it's it's that divine nature that we partake of that allows us to. Uh, express and have this, this love for holiness, which is the kind of love the Father has for the Son and the Son for the Father. Anyway, do you get the point, what I'm trying to say here? I hope that's clear. Are there any questions about that? Okay, but if, if you can understand what Edwards is saying here, you can see then what we're going to be looking at next time. And that is why the Spirit of God is the one who actually applies the work and if you understand what the relationship of the Father to the Son is, if one of the persons of the Godhead is going to become incarnate and he's going to become the Son of God in, in the sense that he's begotten of God, well, who's, who's going to be the one that comes in? The Father, you know? Or is it going to be the Son? So th this is really what we want to begin looking at as we consider the work of the Spirit because the work of the Spirit is consistent with his relationship with the different persons of the Godhead this idea of divine love, which is um, that which drives the kingdom of heaven forward, that which revives, that which converts, that which awakens, you see. All right. So are there any, uh, any questions about that? Are we all thoroughly confused? Okay. All right. Well, if there's... Uh, no questions, or if you think of something, uh, bring it back next time, and we'll, we'll try to uh, look at it and make sense uh, out of it. But from here, we just want to begin to survey something of the work of the Holy Spirit. And again, um, we'll, we'll talk about the, um, the economic trinity a little bit, which simply means in the economy of salvation, in this work that God actually does to save man, uh, what is the relationship of the three persons to one another and to this work. Because um, it, it does answer a few questions about the idea of subordination. Sometimes, you know, you, you run into people who say, well, the son obviously is, is not equal to the father because he submits to the father. Why does that happen? Uh, why is the Holy Spirit submitting both to the father and to the son if he's equal in power and glory to the father and son? How can that happen? Well, we're going to see how that happens. Uh, and it, it, it's not subordination in their being, but it really boils down to their subordination in the work of redemption. So the Trinity is, is really studied in these two different aspects, what the Trinity is like in and of itself, you know, as far as God is considered in himself, and the Trinity is also considered as, as they work out the work of, of salvation, as they relate to, to others. And uh, we need to understand how those relationships work if we're going to understand the work, again, of, of the Spirit of God. All right, well, let's um, quickly close with a word of prayer, and, and then we'll spend some time in prayer.